Why did you hit record before you made that noise? Bengals fans, votes are in. Brock Bowers is your top choice for the 18th pick. You are Locked On Bengals, your daily Cincinnati Bengals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Bengals fans and welcome to another episode of the Lockdown Bengals podcast. I'm your host Jake Lisko. He's your host James Rapine. We're part of the Lockdown Podcast Network here on Lockdown Bengals covering your team every day. We're on YouTube or everywhere you get your podcasts. You can subscribe to the show and that makes it really easy to join the Everydayer Club with the many other Bengals fans out there that make Lockdown Bengals an everyday part of your lives. I appreciate James appreciates. We appreciate every single one of you who makes us an everyday listen and who makes us a first listen. Today's episode is sponsored by FanDuel, where you can get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. $150 in bonus bets, win or lose at FanDuel.com slash locked on. And James, we've been running a bracket style event where Bengals fans have been voting on who they prefer for the Bengals to draft with their first round pick. And inspired, of course, by March Madness and college basketball, we finally got around to the finals and the third place game and the fifth place game. And I have some editorial notes we'll get to later about who I think actually should be perhaps in some of these places, but the finals are done and Brock Bowers ran away with it. He had a tough road and tough matchups. Most of the way, a much tougher road to the final than Olu Fashanu did. Olu Fashanu winning his matchups in this bracket by huge margins until the final, but Brock Bowers emerges victorious with the 57 to 43 margin in this final. Yeah. I think the Bengals fans got it right. And our listeners got it right. And we can debate and we will certainly about whether or not Brock Bowers will be there at 18. I think it's unlikely, but that's what the point of this exercise is. If the unlikely happens in an ideal world, who is a Cincinnati Bengal on draft night and who do they land and fall into with the 18th pick and I, I think landing Brock Bowers a guy who was as productive as he was at Georgia a guy who can be dynamic and explosive in the passing game and is I, I think a better blocker than he's given credit for is certainly someone that the Bengals would be interested in would probably take but a lot needs to happen for this ideal scenario for the Bengals to land Brock Bowers but not shocked at all I, I think a couple of things here it's reflective On one, everyone knowing and being well aware of what a special dynamic talent like that in the passing game could do to this offense. Two, it's a shallow tight end class, and I think people have wavered back and forth about that and are realizing that it is a pretty shallow, and and Brock Bowers is head and shoulders. This isn't like last year where you have multiple guys that are going to go between 25 and 45. Mm -hmm. It's shallow, and you might have – Bowers go in the top 10, top 12, maybe 18th. And then you might not see another tight end go off the board for 30 picks. And that that's not insane to think. So uh, maybe even more than that. So I, I do think that this is the right decision. It's who I voted for every step of the way. Shout out to you for putting together this bracket. And I do think we found something that can be an annual thing. The Locked on Bengals bracket challenge, who you want the team to draft. Brock Bowers coming uh, at the top of it. And for me, I think back to the past couple of years, who would have been on that bracket? And, you know, man, last year it probably would have been a tight end as well. The tight end thirst is very real. The year before, I think Tyler Linderbaum would have been one of my favorites. The year before that, obviously, Jamar Chase. So I, I think it will be fun not only to do these in real time, but then to be able to look back on them a year or two from now and, and just see how things play out. Yeah, I think that that is one of the perks of, of getting some of this stuff chronicled is, is having the history, having the thing to look back on and, and a real-time measure of public opinion. And of course, there are flaws with it. I only have so much of a following on Twitter and only such a percentage of those people voted. And so it's not necessarily a truly representative picture millions. of what Bengals fans it's think. Millions. It's millions. It's a pretty millions. representative sample, I think. My followers are 99% Bengals fans. And so... 
they're Bengals fans voting on this. It's not like you have fans of opposing teams sabotaging it. Currently, Mina Kimes is running a similar poll. Actually, one of our earlier matchups, she asked Bengals fans if they'd rather have Byron Murphy or Brock Bowers. And Brock Bowers is running away for, with, with that one. But it, when you look at Bowers' path to the championship, yes, he won, but Bengals fans were split every step of the way. And I, I find that interesting. Bowers had tight matchups from the second round on, beating out Byron Murphy 58-42 to 42 in our second round poll, beating out Fuwaga, Tali Fuwaga, uh, 58-42, same exact margin, and beating out Oli Fashanu, 57-43. So some very tight margins, which also suggests that when you're talking about second place being Oli Fashanu here, Fashanu might have been in a very tight competition with Fuwaga and with Murphy and with a guy like Johnny Newton, who could have been second place in this entire thing, quite frankly, had he not been matched up. I guess maybe third because he lost to Fuaga straight up in the second round. But we do have some consolation matchups to talk about as well. Third place matchups, fifth place matchups, some, some other thoughts like that that we'll get to in more depth. But it is interesting that there was kind of a split opinion on Bowers all the way to the final. And like I said, while he comes out on top and beat everybody, that he was matched up against. It's not like it's this huge 80-20, you know, mandate. And I think if even going back to Jamar Chase Penny Sewell, Penny Sewell a few years ago, I think even that would have been a bigger margin. Maybe I'm wrong, but 60-40. That was uh, heated. That I, was I know heated. it was, but I think people got there on Jamar Chase. When it Maybe happened. Yet. When it happened, sure. Well, of course. They'll always rally behind who the who the team picks, and because there'll be some logic behind it, mm -hmm. right? If if the Bengals pick Byron Murphy, and and by the way, these are like they're like, and, and we should do time on this, spend time on this. You mentioned Mina Kimes' poll. How many non OTs will the Bengals pick at eighteen? Like realistically, and and that's a topic that we can do teaser. That's why you want to make sure you subscribe on YouTube, follow wherever you get your podcast. I, I think it's. Uh, it, 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 to your point, though, it isn't cut and dry where he's head and shoulders above everyone. And there will be people that are upset if they take Brock Bowers that think that they got it wrong. Just like there were on draft night. There were people that said, oh, Penny Sewell should be the pick. And, and, and so I, I do get your point there for sure. So going back to this time, in fact, almost to the day in 2021, Paul Daner ran a poll. I was just looking while you were talking for, for a historical Sewell chase poll. And yeah. it was actually a bigger margin. It was 60-40, roughly. It was 59.3 to 40.7, a, a slightly different margin. But that's what I was thinking. I, I don't know if I said it out loud, but I was thinking it if I didn't did. say it. 60-40 was Team Chase over Team Sewell in a 5,000-vote survey that Paul Daner ran uh, from April 9th, 2021 to April 12th, 2021. And so compared to our poll, it's like that. But then the... The Mina Kimes poll last I looked it was 70 30. Yeah. So, so it's, it, it is interesting because it's to me, how many people actually have watched Byron Murphy and think that, all right, he's, he's the stud game wrecker. And no, two, the weapon is always flashier. At the same time, how nice would it be to give Joe Burrow another elite, elite weapon? The last time you did that, you stumbled into the Super Bowl. Yeah. You looked up and he was talking about, oh, those diamonds are real. I make too much money for them to be fake. Like that's that's what we were talking about after the AFC Championship game. So it paid off, and, and obviously continues to with Jamar. So I, it is, it's an interesting dilemma. And, and I think the good news is the good news or bad news, however you want to put it. I don't think they're really going to get their option, where no. Bowers and Murphy and Newton and Fuaga or and Fushan. It's probably like one or two of these guys. Hopefully, and, and that's that's probably. Hopefully not. Hopefully they get their pick of all of them. Hopefully there's 18 court, 17 quarterbacks that go. Yeah. I just don't think that'll be the case. Uh, one oh, other poll. If I that's to... the case, then Marvin Harrison Jr. You are a Bengal. Go ahead. One other poll I wanted to mention really quick on the Sewell Chase topic, just because there was another one that Lance McAllister ran about two weeks earlier, March 25th. It was Sewell probably. And, and Sewell won 50% yeah. of the vote to 21.5% for Jamar Chase, to 21.1% for Kyle Pitts, to 8% <laughs> trading out. So there were there was some vote splitting happening there between the two weapons, Pitts and Chase, and, and trading out. 
being another option, but just, just to add another data point there. Let's wrap up the rest of these matchups. Brock Bowers coming out on top with, like I said, some split decisions along the way, which I find interesting. And cover two to six slash seven in the results of this bracket. We'll do that coming up next. Today's show is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, style, eBay Motors has you covered and you want to get your car ready for the spring. So go to eBay Motors now and check out their 122 million parts for your number one ride or die. You're always going to find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply eBay guaranteed fit only available to us customers. One fun byproduct of this bracket is that we kind of have an idea of what the fan voted board would look like. And it's not quite that simple because this is a result of one one-on-one -on -one matchups, but the order, if you just stacked it straight up based on who won, when they won and all those things, it would have been Brock Bowers. Mm -hmm. Winning, we just talked about that for a whole segment. Olu Fashanu in second place, real cakewalk to the finals for Olu Fashanu beating Graham Barton, Brian Thomas Jr., and Troy Fatanu on the way. I wonder if he had been on the bottom of this bracket, faced up against Tali Fuaga, faced up against these defensive tackles. If this would have had a different final, just an editorial note there from me. In third, Tali Fuaga, fourth, Troy Fatanu, fifth, Johnny Newton, and in sixth. It's, it's technically J.C. Latham, but since Newton beat Latham by significantly more than he beat Byron Murphy in matchups in two straight consolation rounds, I kind of did Murphy slash Latham here and, and think that Murphy probably is ahead of Latham for a lot of Bengals fans. Also think that uh, Newton's probably ahead of, of uh, Fatanu for a lot of Bengals fans, judging how those polls went. Yeah, I, I think it's... It, the the debate is is interesting for the Bengals because there there can't be many non OT options here and so where is it where does Murphy and I think they have Byron Murphy ahead of Newton by the way I think I made that clear even though this this poll went this way and I'm not shocked by it Johnny Newton is very popular among Bengals fans and I think they're hoping that the Bengals take him the the ones that are and, and they're hoping that he becomes you know uh, Gino. And, you know, Gino Newton, basically. Gino Atkins 2.0, whatever you want to call him. But I think this is pretty close for how, how I would have it. I mean, Bowers, Fashanu, Fuaga, Fatanu, Newton, Murphy, Latham, something in that range. And the Bengals probably have one of these defensive tackles ahead of some of these offensive tackles. Now, the one guy that is much higher on my board, and he had a tough matchup. I forget who his first-round matchup was. But Amarius Mims should be on here. And and be, because he did, he run into Bowers. It was he ran Murphy. into someone. Murphy ran into mm -hmm. Murphy. I think the Bengals will have Mims ahead of Murphy, but that is interesting, and that's that's the the fun dilemma. And at least we know have an idea of how Bengals fans stand. Where Newton, who's I would say pretty certain to be there out of all of these guys. Let me let me think about. Yeah, I'll say that. I think Johnny Newton is the most likely to be there out of Bowers, Fashanu, Fuaga, Futanu, Newton, Murphy, Latham. I think he's the most likely to be there at 18. Do you disagree with that? No, I think that's fair. I would say Fatanu would be the next most likely out of that he's group. He's high on a lot of boards, man. He, he is. is, but if teams see him as a guard, that that's where I where my logic is there. Latham seems like he's going to get picked earlier than Bengals fans want to pick him. It seems like he'll be picked before the Bengals picked. Fashanu Fuwaga seems like he'll be picked before the Bengals pick. And out of all these guys, uh, Mur Murphy certainly has a better shot than Newton. So if I were to handicap it, I would say the next most likely is probably Fatanu. Interesting. Yeah, it, it, you might be right. I, I think it's close. Well, what I do think is, especially if you throw Mims in there, and I'll just put them below all of them, I think there will be multiple. I just don't know who. Will it be Murphy and Newton? 
will it be Fatanu and Newton? Will Bowers find his way there? Will Will Fuaga, Fatanu, Mims, Latham all go? And you look up and Fashanu's still there. Like I, I do mm-hmm. think that there are scenarios where that happens. Um, a lot of these guys will be gone, by the way, including Murphy, probably two corners and a bunch to get to Bowers at 18. But it could happen. You never say never. Well, you got to stack the board, and we will do this exercise. 15 players, because we're fairly certain at least three quarterbacks are going to be picked. So on the side of conservatism, maybe it won't be four before the Bengals pick, although it seems like it will be four. You have 15 players from pick four to pick 18, and you know you're getting one of them. Mm-hmm. Probably going to be picking from more than one of them in, in reality, because I'm not sure where these edge guys are going to be. For us, when we stack a Bengals board just because of the capital that they've invested at edge and because of where the needs are, although I would have a hard time being too disappointed if they drafted one of these edge guys just because of the value of the position and how good some of these players are. It's just an opportunity cost thing. But anyway, when we look at this list, and maybe you throw in there Quinion Mitchell, who had a tough first-round matchup, lost to Brian Thomas Jr., in the first round, or, or maybe you throw, like you said, a Marius Mims into the mix as well. They're likely to have at least a couple of those guys to pick from. And I, I think that a lot of the favorites here will be picked. And, and that's part of this that, that's going to be interesting to watch on draft night. It feels increasingly unlikely that Brock Bowers is available at 18. We've talked ourselves into the, the path to him making it other teams not valuing tight end highly this and that but it feels like you know the the word on the street is jets colts very interested both teams in drafting brock powers could also see a team trade up to 17 if the bengals are sitting there brock powers is still available and and they're looking at the opportunity and snipe them if they think the bengals would go that route so bowers don't think he'll be there fashanu fuaga have talked about that. Don't think they'll be there. Think Latham's going earlier. And then after that, there's a couple guys that could still be there, but you, you stack the board in case somebody falls. And, and that's why you go through the 15 players. And that's why Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to be very, very high on the list when we do the, the 15 players of, of who the Bengals could pick it at 18. No doubt. And it'll be interesting to see where Mims falls uh, on that board uh, where, because there's mixed reviews on him. I could see him going earlier than pick 18 because of all the upside. I could also see him falling a little bit if the Bengals pass on him for whatever player. So the, the, he's and pretty pretty divisive. What's so interesting about that is, who was it? I think it was Lance Zerline who he said did. in a couple of tweets that he wouldn't be surprised if Mims fell out of the first round altogether. Meanwhile, you see others that have Mims going well before the Bengals pick. Yeah. And, and then you got Mel Kuyper you know, doing stuff that nobody else is doing, like Roger Rosengarten getting picked in the first round and and uh, Johnny Newton, like we talked about yesterday, falling into the 40s. So there are some divisive prospects where there's a lot of consensus this year, more than previous years, I would say. There are some guys like Mims and Newton who are a little all over the place. Yeah, and, and that's a couple of things. One, with, with Brock Bowers, the path is – those two teams. I think the beauty of it is they're, it, the, the Denver Broncos probably aren't picking a tight end. The Minnesota Vikings with TJ Hawkinson probably aren't picking a tight end. Uh, th- there are teams like that, the, the Chicago Bears, that are invested in tight end already, probably not going that route. And so you could see it where there's just a better player available. Someone falls because of the quarterbacks, and, and they, they go that route because of the positional value. At the same time with Amarius Mims, I would just be shocked. Because he has, you look at what Greg Cosell has said about him. You look at what these objective analysts have said, and he could end up, we could look up three years from now when we revisit this, and he'd be the best offensive tackle in this class. And so that, with that potential, there might be some teams that have have him falling to round two, but I, I just, I do not see it. I would be shocked if that happened. Yeah. Let's catch up on some Bengals pre-draft visit notes. And one other note that that was a, a beast tidbit. Dane Brugler's the beast that, that just want to update something. We've talked about one particular prospect and we got his age wrong. Want to update that as well to finish up the show coming up next. Dan. 
death, taxes, Jake, let's go talking about draft prospects, age. What age update do you got for us? So it turns out Tyler Guyton is a year younger than expected. The Ooh. Wikipedia article, not that you should trust it, was wrong. And at some point it became uh, a commonly accepted fact that he was turning 23 this year. And he's in fact turning 22 this year. So apologies to Tyler Guyton and the age-related criticism that he has faced on Twitter. And I think we've talked about on this podcast that he has work to do from a technique perspective. And when you're 23, that's less appealing than with some younger players, like a 21-year-old that has technique work to do, for example. But at 22, that becomes a lot more palatable and is one reason that it's very easy to see Tyler Guyton going at the back of the first round. And that's where he was projected anyway. Just bad age information made it out. And, and we had the wrong age for Tyler Guyton. So just wanted to issue that apology. Well, Jake, let's go officially in on Tyler Guyton at, at 18. That's what I just heard. Yeah, uh, You, you uh, need to get your hearing checked. <laughs> there we go. There we go. That's what I want to hear. That's what I like to hear, Jake Lisko. But you heard I, that? I, I agree. I, I did hear that. Wow. No, I, I, uh, I would be. That's. There's some scary picks. And I don't know if I have time to do it. So I'll just do it now before you get to the visits. Like Tyler Guyton at 18 and Mason Smith at 49. Huh? I'm not saying they would ever do that. But could you imagine? Being there at pick 50, and those are their first two guys. That, that wouldn't be fun, Jake. That would not now be fun. you've put that out into the world. Look, the, the last thing I'll say about Tyler Guyton for this episode is it, as a trade back first round tackle, I'm much more open to it now than I was a month ago, and not just because of the age, but that does help. But after some increased viewing and, and thinking about Tyler Guyton, my opinion of him has elevated a little bit to the point where I'd be comfortable with him at the back of the first round. Sure. If they were picking, if it was like last year. Yeah. Where, where you're picking a guy that you, you can develop and be your future starter. You you have Jonah. This year you have Trent Williams. Or Trent Brown, excuse me. Trent Williams would be fun. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, like, is Tyler Guyton coming in and pushing Trent Trent Brown? No. So, he's just not. He, he's a developmental guy. And so, if you take him at 18, feels like there'll be someone better that, that could either threaten for that job or, or help you elsewhere. Speaking of tackles, let's catch up on those Bengals visits. There is a local to me offensive tackle the Bengals are hosting. The University of British Columbia has a couple of offensive tackles that might actually be drafted, which is very interesting. They were set to be CFL players and, and stay in Canada, but they tested so well at their respective pro days that they've attracted NFL attention. And the one that the Bengals reportedly are hosting, according to Tom Pelissero, this was from April 8th, so we're a few days uh, from this report. He is called Giovanni Manu. Again, played for the University of British Columbia near me in Vancouver and is visiting the Bengals, probably has visited the Bengals this week. And, and like I said, at, uh, I believe, 6'7", 325, ran a sub five-second 40 and had a vertical of over 33 inches and doing that at 352 is uh is pretty crazy we, we've talked about the way Amarius Mims carries his weight and it looks like Giovanni Manu carries his weight similarly like a very strong well-built 352 not a loose uh Andre Smith kind of 352 oh hey Andre like Smith catching catching strays it's just a body type man i'm just i'm just it, trying to paint a picture here you know i think i painted andre a picture smith. let's say they take brock bowers at 18 yeah and they find the next andre smith at oh that's great that's great i'm not that's talking great. about the player i'm talking about the body type man yeah yeah Catching strays. Andre Smith. Andre, I wish you were in your prime so you could come play right tackle this year. Andre Smith is a good play. I got nothing against Andre Smith. Man, you're making fun of his 40 yard dash. Come on. I'm not making fun of anything. I'm saying what are you that doing? Putting that into the world. In the way he carries his weight to Marius Mims and Andre Smith. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. A couple other Mims is built like, he's built like Hercules. All right. He's built crazy Mims <laughs> for a lineman. I mean, yeah. he really is it's insane. Any other thoughts there before we get to the rest of the visits? No, let's get to the other visits here. 
They, they continue to kick the tires on some later round offensive tackles. The other one joining Manu is one of the older prospects that you're making fun of me for. Oh, man. From Here Mizzou, Javon oh. Foster, a left tackle, career left tackle, a 24-year-old six-year player oh, coming oh. out of Mizzou, has been a good pass protector, has mm. been in the SEC, ah. has only played left tackle. and Who starts at right tackle? Go ahead. What's that? Two starts at right tackle. Two starts at right tackle back uh, in 2021, I believe yeah. it was when I looked. So he has played it. You're right about that. Dane Brugler describes him as a backup tackle with some development to do. Uh, so the Bengals continue to kick the tires there on some day three tackles as well. And, and that's a noteworthy bit about this, I think, is there are some guys outside of the top of the draft that the Bengals are looking at as well. Double down. I, I think it's certainly a position... Trench wise, I would be surprised if they didn't end up with two defensive tackles and probably two to three offensive linemen. I, I just, and that's outside of the idea of them taking a defensive end potentially or an edge, which they certainly could do. So we'll see. But yeah, they, they have a bunch of picks on day three. And the, the thing about day three is it's unpredictable and you don't know who's going to be there. And there, there could be that second receiver, there could be corner, certainly running back, but it's, it's open season. The trenches are very much in play early and often on day three. Speaking of day three guys that the Bengals have also had some contact with recently, Gabriel Murphy reported by Justin Mello had a virtual with the Bengals, the edge rusher out of UCLA, eight sacks in 2023 for the Bruins ran a four, six, eight, 40, a very explosive athlete, really good vertical, just South of 40 inches at 39 and a half inch vertical a wide receiver a day three wide receiver projected joshua cephas is visiting the bengals uh i think next week according to aaron wilson visiting the bengals on april 16th so uh, a couple of other day three guys there in addition to some local guys that will participate in the local day or meet with the bengals locally josh proctor ohio ohio state defensive back and josh briggs the Sorry, Jawan Briggs, the UC defensive tackle, uh, a late round big bodied player that the Bengals are meeting with locally. And the local pro days are always entertaining. Last year, I was like, I remember watching Sean Clifford from St. X and uh, Penn State. And I'm like, is he getting drafted? And, and you didn't really think about And he went in the fifth round of the Packers. So, you just never know. They're kind of unpredictable. I didn't necessarily think he'd be drafted, and he he got drafted much earlier than I anticipated. And by the way, good for Sean. That's awesome. But I, I that one stands out. And who knows? Maybe this is the year where Jawan Briggs breaks the Cincinnati Bearcats to Cincinnati yeah. Bengals streak because it's been a long time, Kevin Huber, Armand Benz, where Bearcats have come in and, and contributed to uh, the Bengals, and, and maybe that changes with Briggs. Could have been Ivan Pace. Ivan Pace could have been. Don't remind me. Yeah. Don't remind me. Uh, so oh. so just the, the, to conclude the thoughts here on the, some of these day three guys, could be some special teams related visits, could be some special teams related interests, could be some double dip developmental type players in the mix as well. And, and that's, I think, what you're getting the gist of here with some of these reported visits and interests in some of these later round guys for the Cincinnati Bengals. Last note. We were waiting for Brock Bowers and Amarius Mims makeup pro day. No testing. No updates there from an athletic testing perspective. Brock Bowers clearly feels like what he's put on tape from an athleticism perspective and what he's done in position drills from an athleticism perspective is enough. And Amarius Mims did enough testing in Indy. Thought we might see him do a bench press. Thought we might see him redo his vertical jump. Didn't get those, but went through position drills and so unfortunately, no additional testing information there, which is not really probably a detriment to either of them as far as NFL teams are concerned, but is a detriment to the greed of draft Twitter and getting as much information as possible. Bowers 241, so he's been over 240 in each of the times he's weighed in. Both guys look good in positional drills. It was closed. That's why you haven't seen a bunch of footage or things like that. So yeah, what we will see. They're both content with what they've put out there and I would not be shocked if one of them becomes a, a Cincinnati Bengal on April 25th. I don't think I have any other draft prospect updates to share. So 
That being the case, that's going to do it for this episode of the Locked On Bengals podcast, less than two weeks away to that NFL draft. Until next time, thanks for listening to this episode of the Locked On Bengals podcast. Hootay, and have a good one.